on this edition of 219 West, challenging the status quo. One man's quest for justice for adults who were sexually abused as children. They should be protecting the children they're entrusted to protect. Another man's journey from inmate to activist in the fight to close an infamous jail complex. New York is, is, is moving the way of decreasing the population of people who are incarcerated. And we have the solution. Plus, a Bronx woman seeks to preserve a culture in danger of disappearing. Welcome to 219 West. I'm Naomi Yanni. And I'm K. Dominic McKenzie. On this episode, we're featuring two stories about two men who live in very different worlds. On the surface, they seem to have very little in common. Vidal Guzman and Harold Searing have never met. The connection is that both men are on the forefront of fights to reform legal systems that they believe have failed them. Rikers Island is a sprawling jail complex which sits on the East River between the Bronx and Queens. The facility is notorious for violence against inmates and guards, and officials are ready to see it closed. Last year, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a proposal to shut down Rikers. The plan would have taken up to 10 years to complete at a cost of $10 billion. In February, the mayor and the city council reached an agreement to reduce the 10,000 person population, then ultimately relocate inmates to borough-based jails. That would be a speedier course of action, cutting down the 10-year timeline. But that proposal is still contentious. The demise of Rikers Island could not come soon enough for activists, criminal justice organizations, and even celebrities, who for years have been demanding that the scandal-plagued jail be shuttered. Rekha Shanmugam has the story of a former inmate turned advocate leading the charge that could see the infamous prison close its gates sooner rather than later. When you're 16, you, you always expect something, probably police would like slap you in the hand and you probably go home or something like that. That wasn't what happened. Growing up in Harlem in a single parent household, Vidal Guzman says he started selling drugs when he was nine years old. I was, I was already exposed to the street at an early age. Um, started seeing uh, what everyone else did, um, their way of a living, um, selling drugs. Uh, um, and I think for someone that's yet that young and the mind is still growing, you start to think like that is the reality of how you're supposed to live. He was part of a gang by the time he was 14. At 16, he was sent to Rikers Island for the first time because of drugs and gang-related activity. I didn't know Rikers Island existed for youth and especially uh, someone, a teenager that's 16 years old. His first day at Rikers was unreal. It felt like a nightmare. Uh, it wasn't because of violence, because violence didn't happen to me yet. It was because I was not able to go home. Um, and I was 16 years old, and there's no way that you should send any individual who's 16 or 17 years old to jail or think that that is the way to, to solve a problem. Being sent to Rikers created more problems for Vidal than it solved. I fought every single day I was in Rikers. If it wasn't physically fighting, it was mentally fighting. He says the fighting was because of the lack of programs and activities at the jail. You have 16, 17 year olds who you're not having, at that moment we never had that much programs. And then at the end of the day, you want us to go to school after we just had a fight the night over, or, or, or we know that we're gonna go fight uh, at night. And they used to call it the gladiator school. And Rikers Island was really the gladiator school. Vidal's story is like that of many teenage boys and girls sent to Rikers Island awaiting trial. Last year, the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform published a report on conditions at Rikers Island and many other New York City jails. The report recommended that Rikers Island be shut and the city switch to a borough-based system. In its report this year, the commission projected that this move could be accomplished by 2024. This came after Mayor Bill de Blasio and City Council Speaker Corey Johnson 
announced a plan to shut down Rikers and move the detainees to jails in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx and Queens in the next 10 years. These borough-based sites, and you heard Stanley talk about it, will change fundamentally uh, the way families can connect to those who are incarcerated. For Vidal and advocates calling for the closing of Rikers, the mayor's plan is a long time coming. Rikers Island's reputation for violence, both among detainees and correction officers, has only gotten worse in the past few years. According to a report by the city's comptroller, the number of fights or assaults per thousand inmates increased nearly every year, from fiscal year 2007 to fiscal year 2017. Vidal says violence is part of Rikers culture. I always say this to explain to people who've never been in Rikers, that's like you having a crazy neighbor right next to you. You're going to step out your door a little bit crazy, right? If you know you, you, you know your neighbor's a little bit crazy, um, you can be like, I'm crazy, you know what I'm saying? Because I know my neighbor's crazy, so I got to be a little bit crazy. And that's how Rikers Island is. This is already this culture. People is already, they know what to expect. When he was 18, Vidal left Rikers, only to return at 19. He was later sentenced to the Green Correction Facility upstate and spent five years in prison. He says he was on a mission when he came back. And that mission led him to become an organizer. Started organizing around Black Lives Matter. Uh, with Black Lives Matter, I also started, you, you know, doing anti-sex trafficking protests, um, doing fundraisers for homeless. And I started seeing more positive that I was doing in the community and people started like shaking their head like, yes, keep doing that. It was then that he received an email about the Close Rikers campaign. And I asked myself, I was like, oh, these guys is crazy. They're trying to close Rikers Island down. I never heard that in my life. What do you want? The Close Rikers campaign began two years ago when members of Just Leadership USA stood on the steps of City Hall demanding that Mayor Bill de Blasio shut down the notorious facility. It would be the first of many protests. I don't think people understood what we had to go through to put pressure on him. Uh, we went from places where he was doing fundraisers at his house, we was outside. We met him in Miami in a gym. Um, multiple different type of events uh, to really put the pressure on him. Many New Yorkers agree with Vidal. However, there are concerns about the proposed borough-based system. In Queens, Manhattan and Brooklyn, the jails would be part of existing detention centers. The proposed site for the Bronx is the Bronx Toe Pound in Mott Haven. Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr was caught unaware when the mayor announced plans to build a new jail in his borough. Diaz says Bronx residents should have a say in where a new jail is built. Any new site for a jail in this borough must be thoroughly vetted and the people of the Bronx must have a meaningful say in that selection. The administration presenting one location as a fait complete undermines the entire process. Mott Haven was previously known for having the highest poverty and crime rates in the city. But according to a 2015 NYU Furman Center report, the neighborhood is gentrifying. However, more than 70% of Mott Haven households make $40,000 a year or lesser. At a town hall meeting in March, community members call for projects that will improve the quality of life. Others suggested prison reform alternatives. Okay, you know, a visit goes a long way, babe. When you're right. behind that wall, you want that visit. I'm okay with that. But I want to go to the root. Inmates need 
more help. In other boroughs where a jail already exists, the conversation is different. The detention center in downtown Brooklyn is the proposed site for that borough. While community members may support alternatives to Rikers, some are worried about the quality of life issues. Howard Collins is the president of the Borough Hill Association. This community is very progressive and certainly everybody right away understands the need for criminal justice reform and they're on that page. But the question is how big and then what effect does a larger facility have on this very dense and still growing residential and commercial community. In, in this area, we live very close to everything. So the structure of the building, how, uh, how it functions, uh, whether or not it can have underground parking so the staff actually has some place to go. Collins also believes that there are other considerations and solutions. The city needs to empty the Rikers population. Well, how many of those issues can be addressed without bars. If I can give someone a summons and keep them out of the system, if I can send them to a local court in their own community, if one exists, I think everybody's interested to hear how that component, which isn't about bars, how does that work? Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams agrees with the need to close Rikers. But he says reforming the jail system is just as urgent. I think that uh you know, we have to be extremely careful um, in just the thought that, hey, if we shut down Rikers and move to a borough-based correctional facility, that our problems are solved. And they're not. He doesn't take off the table the idea of reshaping Rikers. In our haste of closing Rikers, how do we modernize, if we have to, Rikers? How do we use uh, uh, technology? So instead of a person having to travel to and from court every day, why can't we use um, a, a, a telecast to have the person speak to a judge right in front, right at the facilities where they're located? There's no reason a loved one cannot communicate every day with a person who's in Rikers Island through um, telecasting their communi communications. But for Vidal and Just Leadership USA, shutting down Rikers is the beginning of a bigger conversation. New York is moving the way of decreasing the population of people who are incarcerated. And we have the solution, and the solution, like I said before, is to build community, put infrastructure that every community is able to have investments in it, as more affordable housing, more reentry program, more counseling therapy. In addition to closing Rikers, Just Leadership USA has mounted a free New York campaign. The goal is to push elected officials to pass laws on bail reform, discovery law and speedy trials. It is part of a national effort to cut the U.S. correctional population in half by 2030. For Vidal, who has gone through the system and is now fighting against it, the goal is to help people and build communities. What I love about being a community organizer is that you know, we get to educate people who's formerly incarcerated or has like family that's formerly incarcerated to get more involved in the community. What I love the most is to see people who came through our office and then seeing them do the work that we, you know, we helped. We, we educated them how to do it. And seeing that work being put in the community, that is powerful. For 219 West, I'm Rekha Shanmugam. With the rise of the Me Too movement, Many women and men are coming forward and sharing their experiences with sexual harassment and assault. And many are now getting their day in court. But this is not the case for some adults in New York State who say they were sexually abused as children. Child sex abuse survivors have ramped up their calls for passage of the Child Victims Act in New York State. The bill would allow victims to file civil cases against abusers up to their 50th birthday. Milana Vin has the story of one man who suffered abuse 40 years ago and is still on a quest for closure. The one about this door here is where he abused me. And this one over here in the corner, that was his classroom. Harold Searing is now 52 years old, but his childhood memories feel like a never healing wound. Harold says that at the age of 12, he was sexually abused by his English teacher, the assistant principal at the school in Babylon, Long Island. One day he took me in this uh, office of his that was like between the new school and the old school. 
like that one. Started to give me hugs and rub his knee inappropriately over my groins. But it didn't stop there. Harold says the abuse got worse and worse. He had me perform oral sex on him in this room. Then he would smoke a cigarette and use that handkerchief. I don't carry handkerchiefs. I can't even look at them in the stores. This is a story about people like Harold, who were abused as children, but are still seeking justice. All because they came forward years after they turned 23. And according to New York State law, that was too late. But they say without legal recourse, their healing is much harder. It's never going to go away. I, 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 and it took me like 10 years to realize this. I just realized this. Harold says that his English teacher was not his only abuser. When Harold was 10, his single mother took him to the Big Brother and Big Sister organization, looking for a mentor for him, a positive father figure. That's how Harold met Herb. Herb abused me in 12 states. Well, obviously New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Virginia, Washington, D.C., Delaware, Maryland, Florida, and Louisiana. Harold says he felt ashamed and never told anyone about his molestation, even his own mother. It's still shameful for me, even now, yes. Harold tried to suppress his pain, and that worked until at the age of 42. Harold, a father of two and a vice president of claims at an insurance company, started to get flashbacks. At that point, Harold says he needed closure. His life was falling apart. Within two years, I lost my job, you know, we lost the house. Uh, my grandmother and my mother died. And I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't keep that file cabinet closed. Harold says he attempted suicide. I took uh, like 90 Tylenol. I figured I'd just go to sleep and not wake up. But I'm still here, so I woke up. Harold wanted justice to face his perpetrator in a court. But out of 12 states where Herb abused Harold, Legal action was possible only in one. I couldn't have sued anywhere else but Delaware. That was the only state at the time that allowed that type of lawsuit to go forward. In 2011, Harold reached an out-of-court settlement with Herb, but he says this wasn't the justice he's been fighting for. It's like blood money. It doesn't make you feel any better. It doesn't erase it. And it doesn't give you justice. You know, everyone thinks, oh, you can get a lot of money, you got some justice. But the real justice would have been if he was in jail. That's the justice I always wanted. But I had to give that up. Good morning. My name is Harold Searing. I sent a resolution out by email concerning the Child's Victims Act. Now Harold is advocating to protect children in his home state of New York. He's fighting for reform of the statute of limitations so that victims can sue after they turn 23. In New York, a victim only has until the age of 23 to file a civil lawsuit uh, and to file criminal charges if it was a very high-level felony, if it was a rape. There is no statute of limitations, but that's only for rapes that have occurred recently. For rapes farther back into the past, the statute has already fallen. Marcy Hamilton is a professor at Cardoza Law School and a founder of Child USA, a think tank that combats child abuse and neglect. Hamilton advocates raising or eliminating the statutes of limitations across the U.S. If we don't let the victim file a lawsuit or press charges when the victim is ready and their claims expire before they're ready, that's a win for the pedophile. It's hard to believe, but New York has some of the shortest statutes of limitations in the country. They're in the same boat with Mississippi, Alabama, Michigan, uh, and Georgia. So three deep south states in Michigan, and then there's New York. And because Harold's abuser Herb was never prosecuted criminally, Harold worries he may still have access to children. I hate that fact because I can't do nothing about it because of the laws in Delaware and the laws in New York. So, you know, he's on retirement from teaching. How many people did he get across over the years? 
The biggest problem with the statute of limitations in New York right now is that because it's been so short, it has hidden the identities of child predators across the state. They have all been the beneficiary, while the victims, by and large, have not been able to come forward. He made me feel special by holding me, touching my hair, and kissing me on the cheek. So I was sexually abused from the age of seven until I was 17, and it happened by my stepfather. My stepfather actually raped me. As a child, Kathy Picard tried telling her grandmother, but she said Kathy should keep quiet. Shh, don't talk about it, Kathy, was her response. So naturally I thought it really was a secret, and I really wasn't supposed to talk about it. And then when I was 28 is when I told my biological dad, as well as my Aunt Judy. Kathy filed suit against her stepfather on the very day that Massachusetts' civil statute was raised to 53. To make it known that I hadn't forgotten and to make it known that what he did to me is wrong. I urge all of our colleagues, let's do more, let's pass the Child Victims Act. But New York, like four other states, seems no closer to raising the age limit. And Professor Hamilton says she knows why. The Catholic bishops do not want any more of their secrets unveiled. What they're worried about is that all of the secrets that have not yet come forward in each of their dioceses. The Senate is right now controlled by uh, John Flanagan, Senator John Flanagan, who is a Republican and also a conservative uh, who really does have a close relationship with the bishops. He has not yet let that bill out of committee. Until John Flanagan acts, the children of New York are at risk. See, I'd go the other way. Priests should not be sitting ducks. A priest has the same right to be assumed innocent until proven guilty. According to New York State lobbying records, the Catholic right to be assumed in two million dollars in the past 10 years, lobbying to keep the statute of limitations. Neither Senator Flanagan nor the Catholic Church would agree to an interview. But Bill Donahue often speaks for the church. I'm concerned about something which nobody else is interested in, the rights of the accused. That's why you need to have this, this money spent as lobbyists. They should have spent a lot more money as far as I'm concerned. They should have bought the best blue chip firm you can get. People who were molested as children have until the age of 23 to come forward. Right. Most of them t take years to actually realize what happened and come no, forward. No, I don't believe that. Okay. I don't believe it at all. What do you why I, I, I think what, what is the cash register. That's why they come out. It's about money. If you were a real victim, why would you wait all these years? If in fact you really have been abused, you have a moral obligation to come forward. The victim has a moral obligation to come forward, and they should do it right away. But nine states have eliminated civil statutes of limitations. Still, Donahue says New York's law should not be changed. I'm in favor of statute limitations across the board, federal, state, and local level. The reason why we have them is because witnesses' memories fade and people die. How are you going to deal with a case from 1961, 1981? How do you deal with this? There's a reason why we have a statute of limitations. But Harold isn't buying that argument. There's plenty of ways you can prove something, you know? How should I know what the penis of two men look like? The only law that there is no time frame on is murder. And in, in a sense, murder, sexually abusing a child, that is a form of murder. You are murdering a child's innocence. So there should be no time frame on that. Harold says it's time for lawmakers to act. They should be protecting the children they're entrusted to protect. That's what should be going on. And they're failing. You know, and they're failing all over the world. And here they can get away with it because the laws are written so poorly. When we come back, preserving a culture made in the Americas with roots in Africa. Welcome back. The Garifuna people can be found in countries like Belize and Nicaragua, but mainly along the Caribbean coast of Honduras in Central America. You can also find Garifuna right here in New York City. But the Afro-Indigenous culture is in danger of becoming extinct. In our ongoing series on vanishing languages, Vanessa Colon profiles a Bronx woman who is a leader in keeping the Garifuna community, culture, and language alive. Bueno, ser garífona, bueno, nuestro dialecto, ¿verdad? Está nuestro dialecto. Y aparte de eso, 
el baile, nuestra danza. Yo soy de Honduras, uh, yo soy de Corozal, de la Costa Norte. Uh, mi nombre es Luciana Bonilla, tengo 25 años de estar aquí en este país y mi edad es 60 años. <ríe> Cuando me mudé para acá al Bronx, tengo muchas amigas que me visitan. Entonces, allí empezó el grupo. Llegan a visitarme, yo las atiendo con mil amores. Y una de ellas me dice, deberíamos de formar un grupo. Tú vas a ser la presidenta, tú vas a ser la, la, la promotora de todo eso. El grupo ya tiene nueve años. Ahora el 27 de noviembre cumple nueve años. Vienen mis amigas y me dicen, tú vas a elegir, busca un nombre. ¿Un nombre? Ay, bueno, entonces uh, vamos a ponerle Guafagua. Guafagua significa vamos a luchar o vamos a tratar. Los africanos aquí entonces, que de ahí somos nosotros, porque nuestros ancestros son de esa tendencia, uh -huh. nunca quisieron ser uh, esclavizados. Entonces fueron de la raza que empezaron a emigrar para no ser esclavizados. Por esa razón cayeron a la costa de Honduras, fueron huyendo. Primero cayeron a San Vincent, San Vicente. Y de San Vicente empezaron a caer a la costa de Honduras. Oh, Garífuna significa mucho, tiene mucho significado. Primeramente, nosotros los Garífunas tenemos una cultura en la cual siempre lo mantenemos. Nos apoyamos unos a los otros y en lo cual estamos orgullosos de nuestra cultura, nuestra lengua, nuestra tradición, todo. Es pescado, se come con casabe con machuca, con tapado. Desde los 16 años conozco a Lucy. Lucy para mí, ella es um, um, amorosa, bastante cariñosa. Es muy importante, es muy importante que tengamos oh, este pequeño grupo, este pequeño, esa pequeña organización para así no olvidar nuestra cultura. Lucy es buena persona porque nos entiende cuando hablamos, nos hace reír y lo mejor que tiene, que nos soporta. Lucy, Lucy es la jefa del grupo, es la madre de nosotros. <risa> And that's it for this edition of 219 West. I'm K. Dominic McKenzie. And I'm Naomi Yane. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.